So good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar for nurses with the topical adrenal tumors. My name is Jamilia Bartelt. I'm a research nurse at the University Hospital of Basel in Switzerland, and I will be chairing today's session. So we will start in one minute. This session will be extraordinarily one hour in length, including presentations and time for audience questions. Please ask questions throughout using the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. This session will, is being recorded and will, will be available on the EC website as soon as possible after the session has concluded. So now I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Alessandro Prite. Alessandro Prite is a clinical associate professor of endocrinology at the Institute of Metabolism and System Research, University of Birmingham, UK. He obtained his PhD from the same university in 2022 and is also a consultant endocrinologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, UK. Alessandro's area of research focuses on functioning adrenal tumors, endocrine hypertensions, and adrenal insufficiency, combining clinical trials and experimental medicine studies as well as receiving awards at the both national and international conferences for his work, Alessandro has over 30 peer-reviewed publications. Welcome, Alessandro. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for the an introduction. So <clears throat> uh, today I've been asked to give an overview of uh, uh, how to approach patients with benign adrenal tumors, both in terms of uh, biochemical and radiological assessments. <clears throat> so most of the information that I will be uh, giving to you today is covered in the recently published ANSAT uh, guidelines on adrenal incidentalomas, uh, which I highly recommend uh, you read. So uh, the topic uh, of the talk today are adrenal tumors and more specifically incidentally discovered adrenal tumors or adrenal incidentalomas. Uh, these tumors are very common. Uh, around 1.4 to 10% of adults are found to have an adrenal tumor. And the older we are, the more likely we are to be diagnosed with an adrenal tumor. And over the last two decades, there has been a huge rise in the incidental discovery of adrenal tumor. And when we look at what is driving this increased evidence, uh, incidence, um, uh, we see that most of these tumors are discovered incidentally during cross-sectional imaging of the abdomen. Most of the tumors that we um, diagnose are small, and they're mostly diagnosed in patients over the age of 40. Whenever we pick up an adrenal mass, um, there are two key questions that we need to address. The first, is it cancerous? And the second, is it producing any hormones in excess? And we should assess both questions in parallel. And to answer these questions, we rely on clinical assessments, laboratory testing, as well as reviewing available imaging. And today, most of my talk will focus on the second questions, which is how to assess whether a tumor is producing hormones in excess. And I will be focusing more specifically on benign adrenal tumors, which constituted the vast majorities of incidentalomas. And with regards to hormone excess, uh, cortisol excess is by far the most common abnormality that we observe, with mild autonomous cortisol secretion, or MAX, being found in 20 to 50 percent of cases, followed by Cushing syndrome. And the distinction between these two entities relies on clinical assessments for presence of clinical signs of cortisol excess, as well as on the um, um, failure to suppress cortisol during the one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test. Then benign adrenal tumors can also produce aldosterone in excess, primary aldosteronism, and more rarely, catecholamines, i.e. fucromocytomas. 
So in the first part of the talk, I will be discussing uh, some um, ways in which we can use the imaging available to inform about the risk of malignancy and hormone excess in the uh, tumors that we see. So whenever we find an adrenal tumor, there are two key questions that we need to answer first. First, is the patient acutely unwell? The parent team might have missed, for example, a diagnosis of Cushing's, or the patient might be acutely unwell with a few chromocytoma crisis. So as endocrinologists or endocrine nurse specialists, we need to think about these emergency scenarios. And the second question is, there are any risk factors for malignancy? I are there anything, is there anything in the history of the patient which might point towards an increased risk of malignancy? And the two key factors to consider here are history of cancer. So if the patient presents with a history of active malignancy, the adrenal tumor is much more likely to be malignant. And similarly, if the adrenal tumor is diagnosed in patients at the age of 40, the probability of this being malignant are much higher. After we have answered these two questions, then the next step is to look at the images and to assess the characteristics of the tumor. So we will look at tumor size, its lipid content, whether it affects both adrenal glands, whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous, or whether it's invading uh, surrounding structures. But the size is definitely the easiest thing to check and one of the most important as well. Because now we know that um, the size of the tumor can provide a lot of information about its risk of malignancy. If the tumor is below 4 cm, the risk of malignancy, both ACC and um, adrenal metastasis, is relatively low, 6 to 9%. But look what happens if the tumor is above 4 cm. The risk of malignancy becomes much higher, 31 to 34%. So the key message from this slide is that any mass, regardless of their characteristics, if they are above four centimeters, they need to be reviewed urgently in a multidisciplinary setting, i.e. in an adrenal MDT. The second thing that we need to look at when we review the images is the lipid content. And the easiest way to do that is by carrying out an unenhanced CT scan of the adrenal gland. So no need for um, contrast enhance, uh, enhancement. We just need to do a plain CT scan. And then we measure the density of the tumor using this um, measure called Hounsfield units, which basically tells us how dense the tumor is. And there are several, several cutoffs that we use in adrenal radiology. And these cutoffs will inform the risk not only of the mass being malignant, but also of the mass being a pheochromocytoma. There are several studies now that have shown that if the Hounsfield units are less than 10, the risk of malignancy is basically zero. If the Hounsfield units are between 10 and 20, the risk of malignancy is slightly higher, 2 to 7%. But really, the tumors that we should be concerned about are those that are heterogeneous or with the Hounsfield units above 20, where the risk of malignancies are much higher, 10 to 20 percent. So the key message from this chart is that if I have an adrenal tumor which is homogeneous and has unenhanced Hounsfield units below 10, I can conclusively exclude malignancy, both in adrenal cancer and an adrenal metastasis, and I can also exclude the few chromocytoma. And just to give you a bit more um, the dimension of how Hounsfield units are easy and important thing to look at in imaging, this is a, a series of unpublished data from Birmingham and the Mayo Clinic in the US, where we collected over 10,000 patients with adrenal tumors who had unenhanced Hounsfield units measurements. And you can see the distribution of diagnosis, benign tumors, pheochromocytomas, adrenal cancer, and other malignant masses, primarily adrenal metastasis. And you can see the distribution of the Hounsfield units in this group. If you look at the benign adrenal masses, the vast majority will have Hounsfield units below 
10, and only a minority Hans Willeun is above 20. But look at all the other diag uh, diagnoses. Hans Willeun units above 20 are by far the most common occurrence, and none uh, of these masses have Hans Willeun units below 10. After we have assessed the radiological aspects of the tumor, then we need to move to clinical and hormonal workup. In terms of clinical assessment, we should look at the medical history of the patient, look for um, comorbidities that are possibly related to cortisol excess, hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we should also ask for history of cancer, as well as family history of endocrine tumors and cancer, which might point towards, for example, genetic disorders. Then the next step is to do a clinical assessment. First of all, to rule out signs and symptoms of adrenal hormone excess. Then in patients presenting with active malignancy and bilateral adrenal masses, which might be metastasis, we should rule out cortisol deficiency because the metastasis might have uh, disrupted the cortisol production from the adrenal cortex. And finally, if I suspect a genetic disorder, I should look for clinical manifestations that are associated with this, uh, uh, with each of the disorders. And the next step is to move to a laboratory evaluation of these patients. So uh, I should test most of my patients with an overnight dexamethasone suppression test to rule uh, cortisol excess. Um, if the patient has hypertension, I should test them for primary aldosteronism. Then I should test patients for pheochromocytoma. And then uh, I will also measure <clears throat> steroid precursors and androgens if I suspect adrenal malignancy. Then there are some more specific tests that I might want to arrange. For example, if I suspect Cushing's, I might request 24-hour urinary cortisol or salivary cortisol. If the patient has bilateral adrenal masses, then I should also request a 17 hydroxyprogesterone to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And again, if I suspect bilateral adrenal metastasis and the patient might have adrenal insufficiency, I should check also uh, morning ACTH and cortisol. There are two things that I want to highlight here. So the first thing is that before the publishing of the latest guidelines, uh, the recommendation was to test all patients with incident alomas with an overnight dexamethasone suppression test. However, the 23 um, guidelines have revised the, re the recommendation, and now they suggest that this should be done in most patients, but there are some scenarios. For example, patients with reduced life expectancy where uh, testing might not be warranted. And the second thing that the guidelines have embraced is that the plasma or urine metanephrines, i.e. the test for pheochromocytoma, should only be performed if, if the Hounsfield units are above 10. So no need to test for pheochromocytoma if the tumor is clearly benign. In the second part of the talk, I will uh, guide you through uh, ways in which we can assess clinically and biochemically adrenal tumors to rule out uh, hormone excess. So I will cover uh, mineral corticoid excess, glucocorticoid excess, and catecholamine excess. I won't talk about androgens uh, because these are mostly related to um, um, risks of ACC, uh, which is not uh, covered by uh, today's talk. So I will start with catecholamine excess, i.e. ruling out pheochromocytoma, i.e. an excess of catecholamines coming from a medullary adrenal tumor. So when we look at the patient, we need to look for signs and symptoms of catecholamines excess. And if we look at any textbooks about uh, pheochromocytomas, you will read that most of these patients will have hypertension, and they often present with the classic triad of headaches, sweating, and palpitations. And then they can also have a series of other clinical manifestations all linked to an excess of catecholamines. However, I will show you later on that this cl classic clinical um, presentation is probably not longer the case in uh, um, current clinical practice. And there are also another couple of things that I want to highlight here, is that 
when we talk about the classic triad, most patients with pheochromocytoma actually do not have all of the uh, symptoms at once. And another important thing is that some patients with essential hypertension can also present parox paroxysm symptoms. So the presence of these symptoms is not a given to uh, erase the suspicion of pheochromocytoma. And another thing that I want to uh, bring your attention to is this one, postural hypotension. This is thankfully something rarely seen in pheochromocytoma, but I should be looking for that because if the patient has signs of postural hypotension, then this could be a sign of a dopamine secreting tumor, which are tumors that are more likely to be malignant. In terms of uh, um, biochemical testing for pheochromocytoma, as you all know, there are two main tests that we use in uh, routine clinical practice. And which test uh, to be carried out really depends on what's available in your center. And uh, both tests um, rely on the measurements of uh, methanephrines and catecholamines, either in 24-hour urine or in the plasma. They're both excellent tests, but they both have pros and cons. The 24-hour collection is considered historically the gold standard for testing uh, pheochromocytoma. It has very good performance, but it's probably not convenient for the patient because it requires a 24-hour urine collection. On the other hand, plasma methanephrines are more convenient. They also perform very well, but they have suboptimal specificity, meaning that they're more prone to cause false positives. However, this can be improved if the collection of plasma methanephrines is done after the patient has been supine for half an hour. Then some centers also have access to urinary um, or plasma dopa dopamine and its metabolite methoxytyramine, which is not essential for the diagnosis, but sometimes can give clues to the identification of tumors that only produce dopamine, which, as I said before, are more likely to be malignant. When it comes to the interpretation of either urine or plasma uh, methanephrines, we are uh, used to think that we should suspect pheochromocytoma if the methanephrines are uh, uh, increased by twofold over the upper limit of normal. However, I will show you that this probably is no longer the case. But first, <clears throat> I want to show you uh, things to look out when measuring methanephrines, specifically things that can cause false positive results when measuring these tests. A big thing to consider is medications that the patient might be on, specifically tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline, and uh, most psychoactive agents can cause an increase in methanephrines. Also, if the patient is under major stress, for example, if they're admitted to hospital, this will lead to an increased production of catecholamines, so leading to false positive results. But there are also other scenarios, such as withdrawal from certain drugs or from alcohol, which can trigger a catecholamine release. But really, the things to look out for are medications. So medications that can affect methanephrines should be uh, tapered down and discontinued for at least two weeks before repeating testing. A common uh, thing is that um, SSRIs, such as uh, citalopram, uh, are thought to influence methanephrines, but uh, usually in clinical practice, my experience is that they are not usually a problem, so I, I don't routinely stop them when I test my patients. Now, um, I told you before that if we look at the textbooks, uh, diagnosis of pheochromocytoma is the patient that presents with large tumors and typical signs of a catecholamine excess. However, there are now several um, um, publications showing that this is actually not the case because the vast majority, over two thirds of cases of pheochromocytomas are nowadays discovered incidentally. Only a minority, 30%, present with uh, typical signs and symptoms of the disease, and then a handful will come to our door uh, because of a positive genetic screening, because of a, a, a affected family member. 
And this is important for a variety of reasons. First of all, patients presenting with incidental pheochromocytoma tend to be older. They tend to have smaller tumors compared to patients with typical symptoms. They're unlikely to have bilateral tumors. But what's most important is that a non-negligible percentage of this patient will be silent pheochromocytoma, meaning that they will have completely normal plasma or urine metanephrines. So this is very important uh, for the management of these patients. And another thing that I want to point out is that although these patients present as incidentaloma, when we do a careful um, history taking of these patients, actually the vast majority will report some signs and symptoms which are consistent with catecholamine excess. So as I said, uh, incidentally discovered pheochromocytoma tend to be smaller. And the reason why this is important is because the production of catecholamines is directly linked to the size of the pheochromocytoma. So the smaller the tumor, the smaller the amount of catecholamines that is being produced. So if we look at what's being published, we now know that Few chromocytomas that are below 4 centimeters are silent in 10% of cases, and this percentage rises to 50% if the few chromocytoma is below 2 centimeters. So what to do in these scenarios? One very easy thing is to look at the Hounsfield units, especially if the, if the mass is very small. If the Hounsfield units is below 10, then I don't need to worry about few chromocytoma. Then, uh, we know that pheochromocytomas are uh, slow-growing tumors, so I might want to uh, up, uh, have a conservative approach and monitor whether it grows over time. Or I might want to monitor the development of symptoms during follow-up and repeat tests if typical symptoms develop. Um, However, there are patients that are particularly high risk for having pheochromocytomas, for example, those that come to us because of positive genetic screening. And in the, these cases, we probably need to be a bit more aggressive. And in selected cases, we might have to do an IBG scan or a, a PET DOTA, um, a, do, a DOPA PET um, a scan. And these are some data from uh, Birmingham, uh, um, uh, from from my center, to which also Miriam, the next speaker, has contributed. And basically, we looked at uh, over 100 cases of pheochromocytoma seen in the last uh, 10 years. And again, we confirmed that the majority of cases are not presenting incidentally. And then what we did is that we looked at their levels of plasma metanephrines, which is what we measure in um, my center. And what we found is that small tumors below two centimeters, more than half of these tumors will have plasma metanephrines that are below the two-fold increase upper, um, uh, above the up, uh, upper limit of normal, meaning that the traditional cutoff that we use is not reliable in this scenario. So in the next part of the talk, I want to discuss um, how we should approach uh, the screening for aldosterone excess, i.e. a primary aldosteronism arising from tumors uh, in the zona glomerulosa. Well, um, so testing for primary aldosteronism is warranted in all incidentaloma patients who also have hypertension. And the way we screen them is to measure renin, aldosterone, and potassium levels at least twice. Uh, an important message that I want you to get away from this talk is that um, stopping interfering medications is not routinely required in patients that are being tested for primary aldosteronism. And this is because of a, a variety of considerations. The first is that often the results that I get back from the lab are still interpretable. Uh, this is less cumbersome for the patient and also for us that are requesting the test. And we also have fewer risks of the patient developing uncontrolled blood pressure if we stop interfering medications. However, um, 
I need to interpret these results with caution. And if I have any suspicion that I have false positive or false negative results, then I should repeat green and aldosterone measurements the proper way. And what do I mean by that? So things that we should look out for uh, um, when we interpret the results. If the patient has hypokalemia, I should correct it because hypokalemia lowers aldosterone level, leading to uh, possibly leading to false negative results. Also, if the patient is on salt restriction for their high blood pressure, I should um, um, encourage a liberal salt intake because salt restriction increases uh, renin and aldosterone levels. Also, I should ask the patient in the, if they regularly consume licorice root because this impacts on the conversion of cortisone to cortisol, which can lower uh, aldosterone and renin levels. And often patients that come to us already take spironolactone and eplerenone, which are mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, which can, of course, impact on uh, renin and aldosterone measurements. However, uh, what I do in my practice is that even if the patient is on a spironolactone or a planeron, I tend to measure renin levels anyway. I know that the results will be impacted by the treatment, but if I get back from the lab a renin that is suppressed, this to me is a clear sign that the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism is very likely. So what else should we look for in terms of possible false positive and false negatives, which can affect renin and aldosterone measurements? So let's start with false negatives. Of course, antihypertensives are top of the lists, spironolactone and eplerinone, of course, diuretics, some um, uh, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, but importantly, not only antihypertensives can affect renin and aldosterone levels. Also, antidiabetic medications, as well as antidepressants, can affect the results and lead to false negative results. Also, if I test a patient with malignant hypertension in an emergency setting, this can lead to a, um, a alteration of the renin and, uh, angiotensin renin aldosterone axis, which can impact my interpretation of the results. Uh, testing during pregnancy is very challenging because, again, this causes um, a rearrangement of the uh, aldosterone production during pregnancy. And results can also be affected if a patient has a renal artery stenosis, which, as expected, will affect the renin production. But there are also several situations which could lead to false positive results. Again, antihypertensives are top of the list, specifically beta blockers. But there are also other medications, non antihypertensives, which can affect the results, specifically NSAIDs. Uh, or uh, oral contraceptives. Also, if I have a premenstrual uh, woman uh, and I test them during the luteal phase, this can impact on the results because progesterone can act on the mineral corticoid receptor, affecting the interpretation. And similarly, if I have a patient with severely impaired renal function, especially if they have hyperkalemia, this can affect renin and aldosterone production. So what to do pragmatically uh, if we want to test the patient for primary aldosteronism? As I said, I would test renin and aldosterone regardless of what the patient is on when they come to see me. Then I look at the results, I consider whether false positive or false negative results are possible. And if that is the case, I do uh, what I can. So, for example, I would advise a liberal salt intake. I would correct hypokalemia. I would retest women during the follicular phase. And if I need to stop medications, I would stop them for two to four weeks or six weeks in case of spironolactone and eplerinone. 
and I change these medications with alternatives which are less likely to affect renin and aldosterone measurements, primarily verapamil, doxazosin, and hydralazine. After I've done all these things, then I measure again renin and aldosterone, and if possible, I measure them in the morning, uh, two to four hours after the patient has woken up, because just like cortisol, aldosterone is producing a circadian rhythm and the highest levels are observed in the morning. And then if the test is still positive, I carry on with a confirmatory test and there are several tests available to us, but the most commonly used are probably the saline infusion test and the Captorville challenge test. However, there is one specific scenario where the confirmatory test is not needed, which are patients with clearly abnormal renin and aldosterone levels in the context of spontaneous hypokalemia, meaning that if I have all these criteria are met, I do not need to proceed to a confirmatory testing. So the next part of the uh, talk will focus on uh, cortisol excess, specifically Cushing syndrome and mild autonomous cortisol secretion, max. So again, if we look at textbooks definition of Cushing's, we would expect to see patients coming to see us with typical signs of glucocorticoid excess, a moon phase, purple striae, uh, um, uh, and uh, easy bruising and uh, central obesity. However, we are all very familiar with that nowadays it's much more common to see milder cases of Cushing's, which often leads to a diagnostic delay of over two years. And this is because we see milder cases, the uh, signs and symptoms of, of Cushing's are not specific to Cushing's, and metabolic complications such as hypertension and diabetes are also common in the general population. However, there are some clues to the diagnosis of Cushing's. For example, if I have a patient with unusual findings for their age, for example, osteoporosis in a 40-year-old, or if they have multiple signs and symptoms uh, um, compatible with Cushing's, or whether these signs and symptoms progress rapidly over time. And the rapid progression of symptoms is also a red flag for malignancy. So if I have a, a patient with rapidly progressive symptoms and an adrenal mass, I should definitely think, think very quickly of an adrenal cancer. When we want to test patients for cortisol excess, there are three tests available to us. 24-hour urinary free cortisol, dexamethasone suppression tests, more commonly the overnight dexamethasone suppression test, or the late night salivary cortisol. And then I'm going to discuss briefly the pitfalls of each of these tests, starting with the 24-hour urinary free cortisol. The first thing that we need to consider when we get the result back from the lab is the result reliable. We need to look at the volume of the urine collection because low volumes usually indicate that the patient has not collected all the urine over 24 hours. In these cases, I can measure also urinary creatinine, which can confirm whether the collection is complete or not. And then there are some scenarios which can lead to false positive results. For example, if the patient drinks a lot during the collection, especially over three liters of collection, this can modestly increase the uh, urinary free cortisol excretion. Then I can also have patients with pseudo-cushings, such as uh, depression or alcohol excess, or in PCOS as well, sometimes I can see increased levels of urinary free cortisol. False, no false negative results, are less of a concern, uh, but it's something to think about, especially in patients with impaired kidney function, with very mild forms of Cushing's. And uh, importantly, 24-hour uniform cortisol is invariably normal in patients with mild autonomous cortisol secretion. Now, with regards to the salivary cortisol, um, again, I should ask myself whether the result is reliable. 
Sometimes the patient do not collect enough saliva that allows measurement of cortisol. And there are some situations which can lead to false positive results. The most common one being that the salivate is contaminated with blood. For example, if the patient uh, collects the saliva right after brushing their teeth. But there are also some scenarios to take into consideration. For example, if the patient is on night shifts or if they have abnormal sleeping uh, patterns because their circadian rhythm will be abnormal. False negative results are less of a concern. However, if you're using immunoassays in your center, which are uh, way less common nowadays, this can be impacted if the patient has collected the saliva and has uh, eaten acidic or high uh, sugar foods. But now I want to spend a bit more time to discuss the pros and cons of the dexamethasone suppression tests. So again, when I get the result, I should ask myself whether the result is reliable. First, has the patient taken dexamethasone tablets? And sometimes it's helpful to measure dexamethasone serum level if it's available to you. There are several scenarios which can lead to false positive results. The most common one are conditions that lead to increased levels of CBG, or cortisol binding globulin, which is the protein that binds cortisol. If I have high levels of CBG, this will lead to high levels of cortisol measured in the blood. Typical examples are medications such as oral estrogens, uh, serms, or conditions such as pregnancy and chronic active hepatitis. These can all lead to increased CBG levels. I should also look if the patient is taking drugs which increase the metabolism of dexamethasone, meaning that dexamethasone tablets are not uh, are not going to suppress cortisol, or situation of pseudo Cushing's again. So if the patient is taking oral estrogens, the current recommendation is that they should be stopped for, to, uh, uh, for four to six weeks. And then I should look, as I said, for drugs that affect uh, dexamethasone metabolism, specifically CYP3A4 inducers, uh, specifically some antibiotics, and anti-seizure um, medications. False negative results are less common. However, uh, the patient might be taking drugs that inhibit CP3A4, such as some antifungals or antiretroviral medications, which inhibit the metabolism of dexamethasone. Or in patients with cirrhosis or proteinuria, there might be a reduction in the production of CBG. But now I want to spend a bit more time to talk about these two aspects, the measurement of dexamethasone serum levels and whether stopping estrogens is actually necessary. So with regards to the first point, as I said, measuring serum dexamethasone can answer two questions. Has the patient taken dexamethasone and is dexamethasone absorbed and metabolized correctly? And these are results of a very nice studies uh, published a few years ago, where the authors measured in patients undergoing a dexamethasone suppression test, both serum dexamethasone level and serum cortisol level. And basically the way to look at the graph is that anything below 50 uh, nanomole per liter was normal results, anything above was abnormal, and then these are serum dexamethasone concentration. Everything on the left of this line will be below what is expected. So this is the patients that we're interested in. And basically what the authors found is that 13% of patients with incidentalomas, which were diagnosed as MAX, actually had abnormal dexamethasone suppression test results, but low serum dexamethasone levels, meaning that these were actually false positives. Several studies have been published since then, and um, cumulatively, 3 to 20% of patients that undergo dexamethasone suppression tests have suboptimal dexamethasone suppression, um, uh, dexamethasone levels, meaning that if dexamethasone measurements are available in, in your center, this is a very good test to improve the accuracy of the test. And now, very briefly about oral estrogens. Are they really an issue 
when we are carrying out the dexamethasone suppression test. So this um, um, this study, um, what they did, they took patients that had the dexamethasone suppression test, they measured cortisol, as we all do, but what they did, they also measured free cortisol. So the cortisol that is not bound to CBG. So it removes the effect of high or low levels of CBG. And the way to look at the, the graph is that they had false positive results, true positive results, false negative or true negative results. So what we are interested in is this group here, the false positives. So what the authors observed is that 21% of women with taking oral contraceptives had false positive results. But this also means that 80% had reliable results. So this to me suggests that it's reasonable to do a test even in patients who are taking oral estrogens. And then only if the, the result is abnormal, I should stop the estrogens for four to, six, uh, four to six weeks and then repeat the dexamethasone suppression test. Now, in the next part, I want to talk about the um, uh, mild autonomous cortisol secretion or MAX. So, <clears throat> Um, as said uh, before, MAX is defined as an abnormal dexamethasone suppression test coupled with absent clinical features of Cushing syndrome. And um, if we look at the distribution of cortisol levels after dexamethasone, uh, if, the dexamethasone if the cortisol levels are below 50, then we say that the tumor is not functioning. If, if the cortisol is above 50, we say that the patient has max. There is not a, a predefined cutoff when we interpret the results, but the result of the test should be, should be interpreted as a continuum. So why do we test for max? There are two main reasons for it. First, because max is very common. 20 to 50% of all benign adrenal tumors. And importantly, 70% of these patients are women, mostly of postmenopausal age. But the second and more important reason why we test for MAX is because now we know that MAX is associated with a very high risk of mortality, cardiometabolic disease, and reduced quality of life. And we also know that there are some specific scenarios that um, carry a higher risk, specifically women. So women not only are more likely to be affected by MAX, but they are also more likely to develop complications from the disease. Also patients with bilateral adrenal tumors are more likely to have metabolic diseases. And patients with higher cortisol levels after the dexamethasone suppression tests also have a higher cardiometabolic burden. Whenever we pick up MAX, um, the decision is whether we should treat them or not, meaning should we offer them adrenalectomy and remove the tumor, or should we follow them up and treat their comorbidities? And the, the decision of which option to go for must be uh, very carefully individualized in each patient, and is based on a variety of considerations. For example, the clinical and biochemical severity of the cortisol excess, whether the patient has comorbidities related to the cortisol excess, how big the tumor is and its appearances, whether the patient has germline mutations associated with MAX, such as ARMC5. Um, and I should also consider the patient's age, fitness for surgery, and also their preference. So this schematics is um, to summarize the current recommendations on how to approach a patient diagnosed with MAX. So the first thing that we need to do, and the guidelines are very clear about it, is that if we have a patient with MAX, we should reassess them clinically for any clinical signs of Cushing's, because it's possible that patients with milder forms of Cushing's have been overlooked. Then, if I have ruled out Cushing's, I need to look for comorbidities that are potentially attributable to cortisol excess. 
And specifically, I need to look at hypertension, dysglycemia, dyslipidemia, and osteoporosis. Specifically, I need to look for vertebral fractures because many patients with MAX have asymptomatic vertebral fractures. And then I look whether the um, uh, comorbidities uh, are alone or in, you know, in combination, how long the patient has had these comorbidities for, and whether that got worse over time and got difficult to treat, whether the patient has inappropriate end organ damage for their age, or if they have a positive family history of adrenal disorders. After I've gathered all this, uh, this information, I need to take an individualized decision of whether I need to treat this patient. If I decide that surgery is not an option, then I offer long-term follow-up and monitor any comorbidity. If I decide that surgery is an option, I should repeat a dexamethasone suppression test to confirm that it's still abnormal. And importantly, I need to confirm that I'm not dealing with Cushing's disease case. So I need to confirm that the max is truly a CTH independent. And I could can do this by measuring plasma CTH and serum DHEAS. After that, I can send the, the patient for, for surgery. And then the approach will depend on whether the, the tumor is unilateral or bilateral. In case of unilateral tumor, the decision is straightforward. I will proceed to unilateral genolectomy. In case of bilateral masses, the decision is more tricky. What the guidelines tell us is that we should remove the larger adrenal tumor. However, there are some less orthodox approaches, for example, doing a subtotal bilateral adrenalectomy or offering cortisol-targeted therapies such as metirapone. However, I'd like to stress that these last two approaches are not currently embraced by the guidelines and the use of um, medical therapy is of label in MAX. So this brings me to the conclusion of the talk. So um, uh, the incidence of adrenal incident alomas and tumors has dramatically increased over the past two decades. And most of the tumors we are diagnosing now are in older tumors and are mostly benign tumors. Whenever we find a tumor, determining whether it's malignant and hormonally active is equally important to guide management. And the overall risk of malignancy is 5 to 8%. And the risk stratification to determine the risk of malignancy relies on two key aspects. Looking at the lipid content of the mass by measuring unenhanced Hounsfield units, and to look at other clinical and imaging characteristics, such as a history of extraordinary malignancy and, importantly, tumor size. Overt hormone excess is rare in adrenal tumors, whilst MAX is by far more common, found in 20 to 50% of cases. MAX is associated with high cardiometabolic uh, and mortality risk, especially in postmenopausal women, meaning that we should perform a dexamethasone suppression test in most patients with incidentalomas and offering individualized treatment. With regards to pheochromocytomas, there has been a paradigm shift in the epidemiology of these tumors, and about 60% are nowadays discovered incidentally. And this poses some challenges because smaller tumors will produce less catecholamines, and meaning that in smaller tumors, the classical cutoffs that we use for metanephrines might not be reliable. And with regards to primary aldosteronism, we should test all patients with incident alomas and hypertension. And I hope I convince you that stopping medication shouldn't be done routinely, but results should be interpreted with caution and, if necessary, be repeated. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for this very interesting presentation. So I have some questions from the audience. There's one question uh, about um, medication. Should only triclics and psychoactive drugs be discontinued for two weeks? 
is one question. So my suggestion in this regard is that I, similar to, similarly to primary aldosteronism, I, sh I wouldn't stop them before testing. So I would test the patient first, because if the result that you get from the lab is negative, then you don't need to stop the medication. Because, for example, stopping amitriptyline is not very pleasant for the patient because they can get withdrawal symptoms. However, if you get a positive result or a borderline result, then at that point you should gradually taper down amitriptyline and other medications such as, such as uh, um, uh, um, anticongestants and uh, stop it for, for at least two weeks before repeating tests. Thank you. The next question. Do you usually measure renin or renin activity and its rap uh, rapport is valuable in your practice? So I, I specifically didn't put any cutoffs in my presentation because, of course, uh, this really depends on the assay that is available in your center. So each center will have their own, their own cutoffs for interpretation. Um, in my center, we use direct renin concentrations. Some centers still use uh, plasma renin activity, although it's uh, less and less used because it's more cumbersome for laboratories to, to measure. Um, with regards to the ratio, uh, I tend not to calculate the ratio at all because in my experience, it creates more questions than answers. So I tend to look at renin and aldosterone separately. I first look at the renin, uh, renin values. If they are normal, I don't worry about the aldosterone. And then if renin is low, then I look at the aldosterone and decide whether uh, my degree of suspicion for primary alto is high enough to proceed to confirmatory testing. Thank you. And there's also a question, what is the cutoff for positive urine and plasma fractionate meta metanephrines? So the textbook uh, cutoff is twofold upper limit of normal. So whatever is the upper limit of normal in your laboratory, twice that. Uh, however, if you have a patient, especially with a tumor below two centimeters, um, and you have normal or borderline elevated plasma metanephrines, this could, could still be a few chromocytoma. Now, it's sometimes impossible to determine whether it's a few chromocytoma or not. So there are some scenarios where pragmatically, if we are sending the patient for surgery, we treat them with doxazosin as if they have a few chromocytoma. So they will, we will offer a medical coverage to prevent any complications. Okay, so one more question. What did you mean by pregnancy rearrangement of aldosterone and renin? Yeah, I know. So that's a, that's a very good uh, question. And um, so basically what happens during pregnancy is that there is a shift in uh, the volume status. Uh, so basically there is a uh, reduction in intravascular volume. So pregnancy is a state of intravascular volume depletion, which basically then creates an activation of the um, angiotensin renin axis. So typically what we, what we observe during pregnancy, especially in the second half of the pregnancy, is an, a physiological increase in renin and aldosterone measurements which is probably the reason why diagnosing primary ALDO during pregnancy is an extremely rare occurrence. Okay, yeah, so the last question, uh, there is someone in the audience who had a patient who had one milligram overnight DST and cortisol went up to over 700 post stacks. He was one of the MAP drugs began with but he, uh, she couldn't quite understand why it caused the rise or how it influenced it. <clears throat> uh, do you know what um, uh, what drug the patient was taking? Um, there's no writing overnight DST. I mm -hmm. don't know what's mean and cortisol. So um, 
so of course first of all I, I, um, it, it would be important to know what medications the, the patient uh, was sorry it was sonitinib ah sonitinib no sonitinib yes. as far as I know shouldn't be uh, an issue with cortisol metabolism because it, it doesn't really affect CYP3 and 4 uh, metabolism uh, but 700 is very high number so either the patient has florid Cushing's because in also in max it's a very very high result or i would be tempted to think that it's a false positive result so i would definitely check whether the patient has taken the tablets or not okay thank you very much so we have some question left but i think we do it in the end thank you very much again